there's a lot more than one type of qubit. We've already heard about all the great things in photonics and in neutral atoms. And we also work on a great deal of that at Sandia. But I'm going to talk about my work, which is on trapped ions. And uh, while we do have open user facilities and our own attempts at making quantum computers, I'm going to talk about our attempts at making ion traps. One of the things that kind of stands ions apart from the other technologies is that uh, the qubits themselves come from nature, similar to uh, in neutral atoms. But we actually spend a huge amount of time and effort trying to create the container for these ion traps. And that's where a lot of our development work is going, also uh, combined with improving the qubit technology itself. Uh, so, the uh, to trap an ion, it's very similar again to neutral, so thank you for that introduction, and I'm going to skip over it, but there's a huge amount of photonics that's necessary before you even get to the device itself. Uh, lasers are used uh, for the most part to induce coupling between the qubits. Uh, we use eutermium primarily in our lab, and uh, it has a very convenient 12.6 gigahertz uh, hyperfine clock state, and uh, this can actually be driven with lasers rather than microwaves, but both methods work really well. Um, and then, in order to actually create our qubits, uh, we need to put all of the ions into the same bowl or potential well, and this allows them to share their emotional states. And then, in order to drive gates across those ions, we just need to use lasers that address different ions. You could also use microwaves that address only ion 5 and only ion 15, but as you might imagine, getting microwaves to be really tightly focused is extremely challenging, so we focus on lasers. Um, <laughs> so how, how do we need a uh, trap an ion? It's going to be similar to anything else. We need a restoring force uh, thanks to the laws of electric uh, fields, we cannot actually create an electric one sink. Um, if we try, all of our electric field lines squared up away from one another, and we get the saddle points. Uh, in trapped ions, we take advantage of this and just use an RF field, but this gives us an RF pseudo potential. Uh, oh, sorry, wrong button. Okay, and so uh, we trap the ions in the center using this varying RF field, and uh, as a result, the ion tends to move around a little bit. But that also means we're using really strong electric fields all the time. Um, and small changes in this field are going to cause the ion to react poorly. Uh, what we want to do is create a trap for the ions that's actually in a plane. Uh, ion trapping's been around for 30 years now, 40 years. Uh, and for a long time, it was conducted using four microscopic rods, which are really great. You can keep your ions forever. People have named them, you know, look, George is still there. Uh, that's fantastic, but it doesn't work terribly well for quantum information. And that's because when you have this giant bowl, it's really hard to pick out the thing at the bottom. Uh, so instead, we want to create these really clean traps uh, that are on the surface of our microfabricated devices. And we can do this by creating uh, RF rails and DC rails. And this gives us a nice tight confinement slightly above the surface of the trap. This of course means that we now need to be worrying about surface physics. So instead of just the physics of the electric field, we now have to be worried about how close that ion is to the surface of the trap. Also, we need to put lasers in there. Well, lasers and superconducting, uh, sorry, and uh, dielectric materials don't work terribly well together. They tend to induce charge. Well, ion traps are not, you know, they're charged devices. We don't want to be adding a lot of that, so we need to work on these things too. Um, in order to trap the ion along the direction of the trap, we segment these electrodes, uh, and this is this is the basics of what we need for ion trapping. Uh, what we are doing is taking this to another level. So we want to build multi-layer devices. These really complex devices that allow us to do under-surface routing and uh, create some of those detailed electrodes, but also protect the ions from some of the problems that the other components that we need are likely to create. So 
All of this started when people were creating these 3D hand assemble traps with limited number of control electrodes or a single surface layer where all of the routing is exposed. What we want to see is all of this evolve in the same direction of everything else with quantum information uh, towards more reliable and consistent operation to be able to store ions for longer and longer periods of time and to move the ions around to achieve 2D connectivity and thus increase our scaling and of course maintain high fidelity operations. So all of those things together give us uh, a few derived requirements. Uh, standardization, of course, we want electrode 10 to be identical to electrode 32 and so on. Uh, lithography gives us a great advantage there. We want to make more than one of these. Uh, Sandia is probably the leading producer of multi-layered ion, multi ion traps. Uh, we're the only ones who are readily sharing our devices across the academic community. And a lot of the groups we've heard of entrapped ions started out or are still using our devices. So we're working really hard to create a lot of these that work robustly. Uh, we also need low electric field noise and uh, we want to work on multi-layer routing. It would be nice, and we can't create these islanded electrodes, but how do we take that further? Um, with that, we need to be worried about things like voltage breakdown. Uh, unlike CMOS technology, where all of this fabrication began, we are applying a lot more than five volts to these things. So we need to make sure that it can survive up to at least 300 volts, and that's assuming nobody moves up higher on the periodic table. The turbium is enough of a challenge. Thank you. We also create overhung electrodes so that the ion can sit above the surface of the trap and is shielded from that dielectric, which kind of looks like a poorly ironed curtain down below. Uh, we also need to maintain the ability to do backside loading holes. So here's a trap where you can see on the top, the top of the trap with the light shining through the back and the same device flipped over on the bottom. This allows us to send ions and lasers through the device various reasons. Uh, we also need to integrate capacitors. So again, ions are super sensitive to varying fields, and as a result, we need to put trench capacitors as close as possible to the DC electrodes so that the RF doesn't cause too many problems. Uh, all of that together has led us to create a lot of great devices uh, over time, everything from a ring truck to uh, integrated microwaves on the microwave trap. You can't see it, but there's integrated microwave antenna down at the bottom of that. Uh, so with this, we're continuing to look at what's next, where are our traps going to go. Um, most recently, we produced the high optical access trap that's above the top. Uh, it's very similar looking to all the devices that are being used because today it's either that one or people have adopted this design into their own manufacturing. The high optical access trap allows us to send laser beams in from the top surface and cleanly make it across the trap without clipping too severely. Uh, along the bottom is our newest, latest, and greatest devices. Uh, we've got our Phoenix trap here, which looks almost identical to the one above it, and uh, our Peregrine trap. So these are all on what we're calling the HOA trap platform. And the biggest difference between these is that one doesn't have a slot. This one does, otherwise they're identical. And they are large linear devices intended for very low power dissipation and high stability so that you can create medium length chains or a couple of chains on the device and start moving towards larger ion systems. Uh, this is just an example of some of the technology that we need to integrate right now. Um, so, we need to maintain this high optical access shape unless we start getting some of those photonics built in so we don't have to send the lasers across. Uh, we need a region to load, uh, which is actually over here where we can send the ions through and the large slotted region is meant for lasers. Um, several electrodes for manipulating the ions, uh, an RF electrode which can dissipate a lot of power, um, integrated capacitors, temperature sensor wires, you name it, we are trying to put it on the trap. Um, this is just a focus in on what some of the specialized regions are for. So it's got a lot of stuff on it because we use it. And with that, it allows us to 
control the ions. So that almost shows up. This is two ions being split apart and brought back together uh, thanks to those segmented electrodes. This is a key feature in mid-circuit measurements that ions will need. Uh, this is us taking two ions and rotating them along the isthmus of the trap. Uh, if you need to swap two ions in place, that'll do it. And this is us goofing around because it was fun and made a good video. Uh, but on these same devices, we can also trap extremely long ion chains. So this whole thing is one and a half electrodes long. We can get a lot more than the five ions that we're using onto a device. Uh, really quick, because I feel obligated, there's a lot more that goes into ion trapping than just the ion trap. So we have, up in the top, uh, is our entire circuit connection that's attached to the inside of our vacuum flange. It goes inside the big vacuum chamber over there. The top flange on the vacuum chamber is this one here. And we actually hang it upside down because dust is a problem just as much as we don't want to be near other charging sources, dust would be pretty lousy. Um, this is just a top view of the picture above, where you can actually see the trap is really inside there and gives a sense of scale. So these are on standard CPGA packages that some of you may have seen. They're like an inch-ish wide, so a pretty small thing. When all is said and done, we need a lot more to get our ion trapped. We need half a dozen lasers. Uh, spanning everything from the UV to the IR range. If we were using calcium, it would be a different set of lasers, but the same sort of challenges. So we've got a lot of different laser launches around the vacuum chamber in order to get those in there. And then uh, this giant beast here is actually a Harris AOM that allows us to do our individual addressing up to 32 qubits. So some of the other fun technology that we have is uh, distinguishable detection. So one of the key features in having your qubits is you really want to tell which one is bright and dark, not just that one is bright and one is dark. And so to do that, we have a fiber array, and depending on where the ions are in front of the fiber array, we'll detect particular ions through that fiber. So these are kind of a challenge to interpret, but this bottom plot is nine fiber arrays with a single ion translated in front of all of them. And you can see how the different ones light up. And uh, we get pretty minimal crosstalk. Now, of course, I've chosen my words really well in distinguishable detection, not individual detection, because these things are about five microns apart, uh, which you can see on the top plot. So hitting one of them with a laser beam and not hitting the other is really challenging. So we really just need to illuminate a large region, which is why that splitting and merging is so important. Uh, we also, I mentioned, have this multi-channel AOM. This allows us to individually address the ion. So even though it's more complicated for detection because the ion itself is going to be scattering off photons and those photons are likely going to hit its neighbors, if we wanted to just change the state of the ion, which is a dark process, then we can do that a little bit more reliably, individually. And so we have this multi-channel AOM, which allows us to create 32 beams that are seven microns tall. That allows us to clear the trap, and then less than a micron wide, uh, which uh, this is all being done with 355 nanometer light. So we don't have much more room to go before we're going to start hitting fundamental limits. And using that, that allows us to do Rabi oscillations on each of the ions independently. So we had a wonderful introduction to what those are. Here are my squiggly plots because I'm obligated to show them. Uh, and you can see that we have uh, two different ions and depending on which of the lasers we're using will cause one to change states or the other or if we choose both. Uh, I feel obligated for the atomic physicists in the room. <laughs> These are decaying because we have not cooled the ion to the ground state, so it's naturally hot, and we get some of that decay. Otherwise, we'd see full contrast oscillations all the way to the end, but we were proving that mutual addressing works, not that our qubits are good. Uh, and the final piece of hardware we have is something that we've been developing at Sandia recently, and it's really cool. It's called the RF SOC. We've named ours Octet. There are several different flavors of these that have out recently for qubit control, but it's really a, a TDS that's been amped up to 11. 
it allows us to create multiple tones on a single channel so that we can apply uh, two different frequencies to the same AOM without going through mixer, which gives us really fine comparative amplitude control. Uh, we can also put different uh, phase on either of those tones, different amplitude, and the different colors are just showing that we can change all of these things arbitrarily as we go along. And this is what is allowing us to do our gains. So we need to have phase, amplitude, and frequency control in order to put the qubits in particular flavors of gates, and this is what's providing that for us. Um, so all said and done, we do have a lot of systems that are beyond the trap, but this is focusing on the traps and what traps need to do to get better. And uh, so once we get a trap back, I would love it if we had an automated tester. That would make life so, so amazing. But the automated tester only tells us that the components are good, not that an ion is going to behave particularly well to any design, or that our new gold coding technique worked, and things like that. So we take all of our traps and test them in a chamber with an ion before they're prepared for use externally. Uh, the first thing we'll look at is the collision rate in the trap. Make sure that there isn't some component that's outgassing particularly badly and that the ions are behaving near to the surface as they should be. Uh, some data demonstrating that. Uh, we found that working over the slot, we're a lot more likely to get noise or ion jumping from one well to the other um, in a slotted region, which makes sense because it's exposed to uh, more angles of collision and dielectrics versus just working over a surface. So we would like to see more of our traps move towards surface-only designs. Uh, we also spend an absolutely enormous part of our lives studying heating rates. So for right now, heating rates are one of the limiting factors in trapped ion qubits. That as long as you're holding this qubit above the surface of your trap, then that qubit is still like accumulating heat. That's going to limit how long you can leave your ion just sitting around before you move on to the next thing, or the total number of gates that you can do before your ion spontaneously goes into a different state. So as a result, we're trying to create traps with lower and lower heating rates. Uh, most recently, we have redone the gold coating on our devices, and we have at room temperature achieved heating rates as low as 24 quanta per second. And while that number might not mean anything to you, that is amazing for us. We're only 70 microns off the surface of our traps, and this is over a five-time improvement from previous. We're almost at the point now where heating rate isn't the leading factor which is very exciting because we get to move on to other things. And uh, it's starting to point that we have other noise sources outside of the trap that we need to work on. Uh, beyond that, the next thing, once we have moved towards making reliable traps, which we really feel comfortable at, we really need to start integrating some of this technology. That it's not going to be feasible to only address 32 ions. That's not going to work for a long period of time. Making these extraordinarily tiny beams from very far away with limited aberrations, that's not going to work for long. And uh, maintaining these detecting schemes where we can only illuminate all the ions at once is not going to work for long. And so what we really want to see is more technology getting integrated into the devices. And this is really where photonics is going to uh, start intersecting with ion trap production. Uh, right now, the things that are close to our heart is integrating waveguides. So if we can just do all the light control, but deliver it directly to the ion, then we're going to have a lot more freedom in the number of ions and where they are in the device. So uh, that's a pretty easy technology to integrate, but there's still a lot of barriers because while the technology is fairly well proven, it's not proven near an ion, which is just an irritatingly good sensor to stray electric fields. Um, so getting these gratings near the ion without disturbing that electric field is challenging. Uh, we also would like to see more modulators. Can we do some of the light control inside the trap? And uh, of course, the backwards to me, uh, and integrating the detection itself. So SNSPDs have been integrated successfully. Uh, APDs have been integrated successfully, but successfully is a loose term from the production to actually working with the ions. So getting a lot of that technology developed is where we're heading. So with that, um,
We have a fairly substantial team at San Diego who's working on this across the island trapping and design side.